Thanks everyone for joining the Population and Family Health Seminar today with Dr. Claire Green. Um, and our chair, Terry McGovern, is going to start us off with introducing Dr. Green. Thank you, Lizzie. Welcome to the Monday Pop Fam Seminar. And I, I this far into the semester, let me just thank Lizzie for uh, the Herculean effort of organizing these every week. Uh, we've had quite a um, quite a run of these Monday seminars this year. So just big thanks to Lizzie and Margaret and Jenny Chang, um, Margaret Kramer for, for really, uh, really pulling this off in a kind of amazing way. So thank you. I am really thrilled today to, to get to introduce one of our newest uh, members of Pop Fam, Claire Green. Uh, and uh, Claire Green is a psychiatric and substance use epidemiologist frankly, something we've needed in the department a long time. Um, her research focuses on improving the effectiveness and implementation of mental health and psychosocial support programs uh, in humanitarian settings by integrating methods in epidemiology, intervention evaluation, and implementation science. She's involved in research to develop, evaluate, and scale up mental health and substance use interventions in diverse settings globally, in her work, she collaborates with governmental, non-governmental organizations, international, international agencies, academic institutions. Um, she has recently joined our program on forced migration. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship in global mental health implementation at Columbia University, New York State Psychiatric Institute, got her PhD from Johns Hopkins um, and her MPH from Yale School of Public Health. She's co-teaching investigative methods in complex emergencies. And uh, we couldn't be more thrilled to have her among us. So over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And I will second the thanks to Lizzie and Margaret, et cetera, for all of the support in putting this together. I also feel just like very lucky to have this like stellar dream team of people that I admire so much in the department to share a little bit about um, some of the projects I'm working on, but also some of the concepts that I've been thinking about and don't necessarily have answers to, but would really like to kind of brainstorm and talk uh, together. And I feel lucky to know most of the people on the call, uh, but I was hoping just to kind of, so we don't have as many opportunities to informally run into each other and share some of our work. I'll just cover broadly um, some of the different projects I'm working on that kind of share this common thread of what I'll focus on today, which is the tension and balancing fit and fidelity uh, for mental health and psychosocial programs in humanitarian settings. So I will jump right in and share my slides. Okay. So first, just to start us off, I wanted to uh, briefly mention why I think this is important to care about mental health in humanitarian settings. We know that in humanitarian contexts, the prevalence of mental disorder is elevated we also know that there's significant distress that all, even if it doesn't meet criteria for mental disorder has pretty important implications on functioning, whether that be social functioning or physical functioning. And oftentimes conflict occurs in settings where uh, health, systems, health systems are fragile and there may not even be a mental health system to begin with. So very few people have access to mental health services. It's estimated that less than 10% of people um, with mental health problems access mental health services in humanitarian settings. And we also know that a lot of the community structures and culturally kind of uh, nuanced support systems that exist are often disrupted during humanitarian emergencies as well. So to address this elevated burden and lack of support or other services, we've seen this real proliferation of what um, are called scalable psychological interventions. So these are brief basic versions of evidence-based psychological treatments. So for those of you who might be familiar, kind of pared down versions of cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy that are standardized and manualized in a way so that even non-specialists can deliver them in settings where we don't have existing mental health providers, um, or maybe are interested in integrating mental health services into primary care. 
And the good news is we've seen kind of growing evidence supporting the effectiveness of psychological interventions for reducing symptoms of mental disorder like depression and anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress in both humanitarian and uh, low and middle income countries more generally. But one of the limitations here is most of this evidence is really generated through randomized controlled trials, which we know are very, provide really kind of robust estimates of the effectiveness but there's obviously this challenge of limited external validity, which makes it so that sometimes the findings we draw from these trials are hard to kind of uh, realize in practice when there's more clinical or population heterogeneity. But because of this really robust evidence about the effectiveness of these interventions, we've seen this push towards implementation science and now testing strategies to scale up mental health interventions in low and middle income countries or integrating mental health services into humanitarian health services. And this body of research has started to identify a lot of really exciting um, strategies such as task shifting or training non-specialists to deliver basic mental health care or have tested models for integrating mental health into primary care and show at least in our research evidence that these strategies are feasible. But I'd say the, the bad news or the, the less good news is that these advancements really haven't translated into any sort of population level impact or any sort of reduction in mental disorder. And so the prevalence data I'm showing now on this slide are at the regional level, which is obviously very macro level. But even when we look at the data on at the national level or subnational level in places that have tried to scale up mental health services, we still don't see an impact at the population level in terms of moving the needle on the burden of mental health problems. And so this challenge, and I think the issues with translating research into practice is something that I've been thinking about a lot and trying to think about this question of why have we not seen any sort of population level impact of this increased investment in mental health. I think there are probably a lot of reasons here, including that perhaps we have to take more of a public health approach to thinking about mental health. We need to invest in prevention, et cetera. And I'm sure plenty of you have ideas why this might be the case as well. But two potential explanations for this that I wanna focus on today include that perhaps the, the programs and strategies that we know are effective aren't being implemented, at least with fidelity in practice. We've seen that a lot of the scale-up studies of psychological interventions end up not being adopted or sustained due to their complexity and challenges with maintaining fidelity. But another explanation is that these programs that we've tested in intervention and implementation research may not actually fit the population in context. And so this leads me to this main theme of my talk today about this tension and really trade-off between fit and fidelity. So fidelity is defined as the extent to which an intervention is implemented as it's intended. And the assumption here is that if we implement psychological interventions with high fidelity, this will translate to better intervention outcomes. There are some meta-analyses that suggest that this assumption might actually not be valid. Um, but I think this assumption has really been the foundation for a lot of the work on these scalable psychological interventions that really standardize procedures and assume that if we follow this set of procedures and set of sessions or intervention sessions that that will yield better outcomes. On the other side of the spectrum, we have fit, which is the relevance or the compatibility of the intervention in the population and context. So this may refer to cultural compatibility or implementation compatibility. It's essentially how well does this program fit within an existing health system, within a, an existing culture, context, community system, et cetera. So a lot of what I've done uh, previously and still currently has been focusing on, and I think this also reflects where a lot of the efforts in the field of global mental health currently are. It's been to take these psychological, these scalable psychological interventions as a starting point and aiming to implement them with fidelity or as intended in a population as a mechanism to improve mental health. But generally people recognize that aspects of these interventions need to be tailored to local context and culture, et cetera. And this process of taking a very high fidelity intervention and adjusting it to fit the context is often referred to as the cultural adaptation process. But one thing that we found is that 
cultural adaptation is really complicated. It's really hard for people who aren't experts in a specific intervention to know what about this intervention can we change? What can we modify without compromising fidelity to the core components or the active ingredients of that intervention? And so recently we conducted an expert consultation meeting and actually Alistair was there with us with over with a lot of humanitarian practitioners, academics, policymakers, et cetera, from over 30 countries to try to understand specifically what some of the challenges were for applying evidence-based uh, substance use and mental health interventions in humanitarian settings. And I think by and large, the, um, one of the lessons that came out of that was that practitioners have a hard time knowing how to adapt evidence-based interventions to the local context. So this process of cultural adaptation that we have said is so important, it's just a very complicated and hard process to understand. And to me, what this indicates is that there's some real fit and usability issues of some of these existing scalable psychological interventions that we often see as really accessible um, evidence-based tools to improve mental health. So all of this has made me really wonder if we're approaching this problem and these concepts about fit and fidelity in the right way. So we recently completed a review of determinants of mental health services implementation in low and middle income countries. Believe it or not, this is an overly simplified version of this causal loop diagram. I didn't wanna make anyone totally nauseated by, by presenting the full version, but happy to share if you're interested. So what we see here is at the center are these implementation outcomes in bold. So we have things like supply of mental health services. This is like the availability of services, access to services. And then at the middle, we have demand for services. These are uh, concepts like help seeking or retention in care, and then quality of mental health services, which refers to really the effectiveness of those services. And in theory, what we'd expect is if services are available, people want to use them and they're effective, that this would translate into a reduction in the prevalence of mental disorder and improvements in mental health. As we see the picture is much more complicated, there are all of these other factors that contribute to these different implementation outcomes, two of which I'll focus on today, which, which relate to this concept of fit, kind of the cultural relevance and the process of engaging communities in, in terms of improving access demand and quality of mental health services. So that being said, much of our focus in global mental health has really been as a field on increasing supply of mental health services through task shifting or integrating mental health care into primary care. And I think, you know, on some level, these approaches are all very necessary given the lack of existing mental health providers and difficulties accessing mental health care. But as I mentioned earlier, these very supply side focused approaches have not yet translated into any sort of public health impact. And so why, why have we been focusing for so long on these supply side approaches? And I think one answer to this might relate to who we're listening to. So these are some data from um, a qualitative study that we're just kind of analyzing now focused on access to mental health and psychosocial support for internally displaced persons in Ethiopia. And as part of this study, we interviewed mental health providers and humanitarian workers and people with lived experience with mental health problems um, and community advocates, a bunch of different stakeholders and, and essentially asked them this question of how do you recommend to improve access to mental health and psychosocial support specifically for internally displaced persons. And when we ask the mental health providers, their recommendation or suggestion to us is that we should really send psychiatrists and send psychologists to these IDP camps and communities in order to address this gap in access to care. And then when we ask NGO workers or other practitioners, their suggestion is, and this is all very simplified obviously, but to, to apply these scalable psychological interventions I presented to you earlier and train some non-specialists to deliver these programs or provide more structured psychosocial and recreational activities. But then when we ask community members or people with lived experience, we get an answer that's quite different. And here there's really this desire for some restoration of culturally supportive practices in Ethiopia through coffee ceremonies, 
which are essentially a place or a space for people to come together and support each other and talk about their problems. So what this qualitative research I just presented really re revealed to me is that the strategies we've invested in, these more supply side focused strategies are much more geared toward the recommendations of specialists and don't necessarily reflect what the communities are asking for. But we see based on this, this diagram that in order for us to for increased supply to translate to a reduction in the prevalence of mental disorder, there has to be demand for these services. And we also see that key drivers of demand are these concepts of cultural relevance and fit, as well as community engagement, ownership, and trust. So all of this has kind of brought me to this place recently where I'm starting to rethink a lot of the focus that I've been doing in my work on these more supply side strategies in order to improve access to mental health and psychosocial support and kind of moving toward thinking more about demand and demand side approaches as a critical leverage point to enable us to actually have produce a population level impact in terms of um, improving mental health. So an example of some of these concepts has been highlighted in some work that we're currently doing around self help plus or SH plus, which is another, it is one of these scalable interventions. It's a low intensity group based psychosocial intervention that includes this illustrated guide, as well as some audio recorded materials that present different mindfulness and stress management techniques as a way to help people cope with adversity. So in the original pilot of SH plus in Uganda, which happened about three or four years ago, um, some of my colleagues who led this work essentially found that men in particular were not at all interested in this program. They wouldn't show up to sessions. If they showed up, they often came drunk. And for us, this revealed two things. The first was that there was no demand for this type of intervention among men. And the second was really that SH plus didn't fit their needs. And so this initial trial that concluded a couple of years ago was restricted to women and they found that among women, at least, they showed um, significant declines in distress. And also uh, there's a paper coming out soon by one of my friends and colleagues who um, found that this intervention actually prevented the onset of mental disorder, which is really exciting given that we have, I think, much less evidence around prevention approaches relative to treatment in mental health. So then after this trial happened and after uh, we concluded our work, it was really interesting because a lot of the men from the communities then came back to us and said, we saw the skills that our wives or the women are in our lives have acquired. We saw the value that this added to their lives. Now we're interested. We want some of whatever you gave her essentially. And so in some ways this started to generate some demand around the intervention, but we still needed to affect or to deal with these design issues. And so we worked with men in these communities to start to redesign elements of SH plus and make it fit their needs. So just some examples of that. We went through these redesign workshops and pilot tested different elements of the intervention, including an added alcohol component, including different strategies for engaging men in the intervention until we arrived at a redesigned version of SH plus that really fit the needs of men and and that they were interested in. And so we're now currently preparing to start this trial of SH plus in Uganda among men. So st stay tuned on that front. Um, but it, for me, this was really the first example of how community led and community design of interventions can be a really powerful tool in order to make interventions fit the needs of populations and be something that community members are interested in. So I mentioned human-centered design and just briefly wanted to cover kind of the, um, provide an overview, I guess, of what this approach is. So human-centered design grounds the design of an intervention and implementation processes in information about the population and about the context to ensure that the intervention fits those needs and are, is also usable. And the process itself is very much demand side focused. It more meaningfully engages with stakeholders as really central contributors to the development of the intervention and also to figuring out how it should be implemented and situated within a community. 
The idea being that the resulting human-centered program is something that is more usable um, among members of that community. So comparing it to the scalable psychological interventions I presented earlier, this human-centered approach really shifts our starting point from focusing on fidelity to instead starting with fit and thinking about how do we design programs and, and really position fit as our starting point to ensure that interventions fit local needs, resources, capacity, thereby making them more usable, enhancing fidelity, and ultimately serving as a pathway towards more sustainable scalability. So I kept using that term usability on the previous slide, um, and I just wanted to quickly define it. So usability is the extent to which an intervention can be used by specified users, being providers or clients, uh, to achieve a specified goal with effectiveness, ef efficiency, and satisfaction. So revisiting these concepts of scalable psychological interventions, I think there are a lot of strengths of these approach, notably that they're very well engineered and very robust solutions to well-defined problems. But I think the challenge is that reality is often more complex, and this is why we have all of these usability issues. And a few usability problems I wanted to highlight include that people are often much more complex and don't necessarily present with a well-defined singular problem. They might present with a different constellation of symptoms. There's often a lot of comorbidity in mental health. There's also a lot of cross-cultural differences in terms of how mental health problems present. And so perhaps these scalable psychological interventions that are designed to really well address a single problem are more difficult to address the complex needs of people. These people are, are complicated. We also know that people and their problems vary and these scalable solutions are often applied as kind of this one size fits all solution to address a range of problems, a range of severity in terms of need and a lot of heterogeneity that I think they're not necessarily designed to capture. And then the third usability issue is that mental health interventions and implementation of these interventions might actually be over-designed or over-engineered. They're often very long and complicated and inflexible. So the last part of this talk, I'm gonna present a few strategies with some examples that I hope or think might promote usability of these different mental health interventions. Um, and I'll kind of complement these strategies with a few examples from my current work. So the first is to address the complexity of individuals. I think we need more flexible intervention approaches. Second, to address the heterogeneity that exists within populations requires more of perhaps this precision public health approach where people are matched to the appropriate interventions that fit their needs instead of applying interventions as kind of this one size fits all solution. And finally, to address some of the challenges related to the complexity of interventions themselves that are hard to adapt and to force to fit a certain context, I think perhaps these community-led and human-centered design processes might help us overcome some of the usability challenges I presented on the previous slide. So first, just to start with the some of the strategies around improving flexibility, I wanted to present a, one project that where we're applying a transdiagnostic modular intervention that's known as CEDA, which stands for the Common Elements Treatment Approach. And it's transdiagnostic in the sense that it's an intervention that's able to address a range of mental health problems, including trauma-related stress, depression, substance use, anxiety, et cetera. And the way this intervention was designed is the developers basically deconstructed a lot of the evidence-based psychological interventions and distilled what kind of the core components of each of these interventions were and created modules that specifically address that, that kind of target problem or target area. The reason this is useful is let's say I show up and I am experiencing depression that's related to a prior history of trauma and also am misusing alcohol the therapist that I work with could say, all right, so we're going to combine this component of behavioral activation to treat your depression with perhaps some um, methods to confront those fears related to those traumatic memories and also some components related to your alcohol use. So it's really personalized and flexibly customized to meet the needs of that patient's presenting problems. 
The other advantage of this approach is that it can also be delivered by non-specialists. And so the, the people who have really led the work in the area of CEDA have been able to show pretty promising effects of CEDA being delivered by non-specialists in a variety of, of low and middle income settings, as well as um, humanitarian settings. And another promising piece of this is that they found a lot of evidence supporting its impact on a variety of mental health outcomes, which is how it was designed. Um, on substance use, and also actually when delivered to couples on reducing gender-based violence, which is, I think, pretty rare in terms of a lot of the psychological interventions we focus on. The biggest disadvantage of something like CETA, however, is it is still quite long and cumbersome and takes months to deliver, so it is, it's complex still. So we're currently in the early stages of a study in Montapala Refugee Settlement, which is in Northern Zambia, where we're testing CETA as part of the stepped care system in order to address hazardous alcohol and harmful, uh, hazardous and harmful alcohol use, as well as co-occurring mental health problems. As you can see, we're working with a range of partners to figure out how to situate this program within the existing health and protection system for both refugees and for the host population in Montapala. And the reason I present this slide is it also relates to the second point of precision. And so the idea of this intervention is that uh, CEDA is kind of considered the highest level of care for people who require the most specialized support. But this is only part of the step care system where people who present with hazardous or harmful alcohol use will first uh, participate and complete a brief kind of motivational interviewing based intervention which for some may be sufficient to address their alcohol issues. But for those who might have more severe problems or co-occurring mental health problems, they can be then referred up to receive uh, the full course of CETA. A similar stepped care model that we recently received some pilot funding from the Irving Institute at Columbia to work on um, in Peru, it, builds on some recent work by UNHCR with some colleagues at Teachers College in Colombia who have been uh, working with Venezuelan migrants in Peru who either have a background in, as a psychiatrist or are a psychologist or social worker, but unable to actually find work within the Peruvian health system due to licensure issues. And so they've been working with a local NGO that essentially will allow these mental health providers to deliver um, interpersonal therapy through this NGO to other members of the, of the community. But IPT or interpersonal therapy is still pretty complicated and we're not sure how well it necessarily will fit the context. It's probably better for people with mental disorder, may not, may be too much for people who are experiencing um, sub-threshold symptoms of distress. And so part of this pilot study is to work with non-specialist community members and migrants to develop and generate a very brief psychological and psychosocial intervention that they can then administer and deliver to members of the community. It's kind of an initial gateway um, to either refer them up to full IPT or interpersonal therapy if they require more specialized services. Or for many, and we actually think for most, this kind of brief psychosocial intervention and psychological intervention may be sufficient in order to alleviate the distress that they're experiencing. And so the idea here is really to try to use resources as efficiently as possible in order to tailor kind of interventions according to the level of care um, that people require. So this stepped care and precision model, I also wanted to emphasize really extends beyond the clinical interventions that I focused on uh, with the past two examples to other more psychosocial and community-based interventions, which I think is really important uh, given that there are a lot of tools beyond these clinical interventions to address mental health and psychosocial well-being. So one of the things I'm really interested in is figuring out how can we bridge, better bridge these levels of care uh, with some more community-based and multi-sectoral supports in effort to better match and tailor interventions to pe meet people's needs. So just as an example, we're just now finishing up some work in Venezuela where we were able to work across the spectrum of interventions from integrating basic social considerations into the way COVID-19 infection prevention kits were distributed all the way up to ensuring that people had linkages to psychologists if they needed specialized care 
And the piece of this that people actually reported as being most helpful to them, um, which was actually the only piece of this, this package of care that was not planned pre-implementation, is this piece around caregiver support. So early on in the project, um, when we were working with these communities and with these public health officers who were managing the COVID-19 response, they reported that a lot of people in the community, primarily caregivers, were experiencing a lot of distress and fear and issues around parenting, et cetera, during COVID-19. And so we worked to generate this, this piece of this uh, package of care that was very much responsive to the needs of the population. It fit what they were asking for and appears to have been kind of the most uh, salient problem or most salient component of this um, package of services as described by the community. All right, so just to wrap things up, I wanted to present an example of the third strategy, which I'm really excited about, which is this piece around human-centered design. So this is a project where we originally aimed to test a very simple psychosocial intervention across these three contexts in Ecuador and Panama. And we wanted to specifically see how were the adaptation requirements different or the required adaptations different across these different contexts? And how was implementation different? What were the differences in terms of how we had to deliver this intervention? What was well received? What worked? What didn't work? And we intentionally selected these three communities that are quite different in terms of um, their kind of geography, but also the populations that we were focused on in each of these sites. So just to pr provide you with a little bit of context, um, the first location, Guayaquil, Ecuador, is a, ur an urban center in Ecuador um, that has for a very long time hosted a lot of Colombian refugees, more recently migrants and refugees from Venezuela, and is primarily a destination city for many migrants who are seeking a place where they anticipate being able to find jobs and work. That is in contrast to Tolcan, which is a town on the border of Colombia and Ecuador. That is much more of a rural remote town. Um, most of the migrants in this area are transiting through, to, through Tolcan. So we'll stay for maybe up to 30 days, but that's it. Um, and that's in contrast to San Miguelito, for example, which is a, a peri-urban um, town outside of Panama City. And in a lot of these peri-urban areas, we've seen a growing number of these migrant communities um, where there's still access to Panama City in terms of work, but housing and other fact or and other things are more affordable. So these contexts are very different. And we wanted to see essentially, given these population differences and the contextual differences, how would implementation of this psychosocial program differ across these contexts? But first we wanted to better understand the needs of uh, specifically women. This was a study focused on women or is focused on women um, across these three sites. And so these are some of the most salient mental health and psychosocial problems that affected migrant women in uh, Guayaquil, Tolcan and in San Miguelito. You'll see that these top three rows indicate the three most salient problems that women, migrant women reported experiencing. And then I've added a few others that I think relate to some of the broader themes that we found. And you'll notice that there are some similarities across these three contexts. For example, worry, stress, and thinking too much came out in all of the three sites as a really important problem. But what seemed to differ really was what was driving that worry and stress. So in the context in Guayaquil, for example, a lot of concern related to economic stress and also community security and community violence came out pretty saliently. In Tulcan, there was a lot of concern um, and worry and stress related to migrant and host community tensions. And then in Panama, a lot of the worry and stress was related to, again, lack of work and economic stress, but also uh, COVID-19 came out much more prominently in this site as well. The other thing that I think is interesting about these results is we see that there are a few issues that kind of immediately wouldn't strike me as mental health or psychosocial problems, including intimate partner violence and xenophobia um, and community rejection. And I think for our teams and for the participants that we spoke with, it was impossible to kind of disentangle these experiences of violence and xenophobia from psychosocial well-being, which I think is really fascinating. 
and perhaps speaks to some of these arbitrary boundaries that we place around what, what is mental health, what is psychosocial well-being versus all of the other aspects of, of people's lived experience. And then the last thing I wanted to mention here is that we also conducted some of these, some in-depth qualitative interviews to understand recommended intervention strategies uh, to address these problems. And this revealed to us a really strong preference for primarily group-based psychosocial interventions that focused on promoting social cohesion, mobilized community support. I think a lot of this has been also uh, amplified because everyone's feeling very disconnected and isolated due to COVID, um, which all made us realize that the original intervention we had proposed from the outset, which was a, an individually focused intervention, was just not fitting what women were telling us they wanted or needed. I also quickly just wanted to mention some of the, the impact of COVID here. And so I've highlighted a few quotes from women that we interviewed talking about how COVID-19 has really amplified and exacerbated a lot of the challenges that they're experiencing. The first kind of on the left in purple, this woman's talking about how her fear of contracting COVID-19, if she were to die, how would some, how, who would take care of her children? And then in the middle, um, related to these issues of community cohesion and support, there, uh, one woman described that because of COVID-19, a lot of the, the informal sources of social support and the support they were receiving from communities had kind of gone away because everyone was afraid of contracting COVID. And then on the right-hand side, we saw that um, a lot of the work opportunities had kind of disappeared. And so women were having much more trouble finding work and there was added economic pressure, et cetera. So really this entire experience that we identified that women were going through, migrant women were going through was really exacerbated tremendously by um, the pandemic for prim in a lot of ways for these like social and economic reasons primarily. So this brought us to kind of rethink our initial plan. Uh, initially, as I mentioned, we were going to take this individual psychosocial intervention, culturally adapted across these three contexts and see how it performed. But this has made us really rethink this approach and instead say, maybe we need to start with what these needs are and what the recommended intervention strategies are and design a psychosocial intervention really to fit those needs and fit those priorities. And so the process that we're actually just starting like this week actually is this process of um, design cycles. So we're bringing together community representatives to go through and talk about, well, first to present to them our qualitative findings and then have them sit down and brainstorm solutions, brainstorm strategies, potential mechanisms to address these problems that they identified which we will then take this information and see what are the potential psychosocial intervention components that we can combine to address that fit those suggestions, potentially drawing from evidence-based practices or generating information or generating components based on the information we get from communities. The third step of this is then just piloting it, taking it back to the communities and running some mock sessions to get input about how these intervention sessions work, if there are any changes or recommended adaptations that we should make to improve the design. And this is all very much an iterative process. The idea is that we go through this kind of brainstorming and prototyping and testing process until we arrive at a, a solution and intervention that's optimized to fit the needs of those populations um, and these communities that we're working with. And once that's completed, we'll work with these different communities to then answer this question that I'm really interested in, which is how, how do we actually implement this? How do we get this into communities? And one of the things that I am hopeful about this process and really excited about is I think just this um, human centered design process, the process of engaging communities in the design of the intervention will hopefully generate ownership over that intervention such that the people who designed the intervention can become the facilitators, the co-facilitators, the owners of that program, which in theory may promote adoption and sustainability in the long term. So hopefully this year, our next steps are to uh, finish this design process and then pilot this approach, test it in terms of feasibility 
And then depending on congressional budget approvals and things that are outside of our control, um, the program that this is funded through may have kind of a second installment, which would allow us to actually compare and evaluate the effectiveness of these approaches, as well as to look more critically at implementation. And what I think would be super interesting and something I'm very hopeful about is I think it might be interesting to take this more locally designed intervention that's optimized to fit the needs of the population and compare it against the more traditional cultural adaptation process of one of those existing scalable psychological interventions and really get a sense of how these perform in comparison to each other in terms of effectiveness, in terms of adoption, implementation, and ultimately sustainability. So I'm also currently in the process of working on a few um, applications where I'm thinking about applying these human-centered design approaches to actually developing implementation strategies. And the idea here is I'm really interested in one in figuring out how can we optimize delivery of mental health and psychosocial support so it's more equitably available and accessible to communities, particularly harder to reach communities like populations on the move and migrants in transit. So this is kind of a future direction and where I hope to take this. So just to conclude, I'm bringing all of this back to the beginning. Uh, these determinants of implementation are all very complicated. I hope that from this kind of we can take away and agree that we really need to look at this big picture instead of focusing in on one piece of this complex puzzle. And today what I've talked through are some of the ideas that have been kind of swirling around in my brain related to community-led processes for design and precision public health strategies as a way to reframe some of our approaches. But I also recognize that there are a lot of challenges with these strategies. So with the rest of our time and with this discussion, I'm really curious to hear more about some of your thoughts and ideas about the strengths and limitations of this approach. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward to chatting. Thank you, Claire. That was excellent. I see you already have a, Alistair has a comment already. Oh, yes. Perfect. Others. I can stop sharing. Thank you. Go ahead, Alistair. Or is it in the chat, perhaps? Uh, yeah, I think you may have had to leave. Let me see. Can you see it? Yes. So, Alistair, I can comment on it. So he says, I think this formulation of the tensions between fidelity and contextual adaptation is really important. Um, I've been impressed by the WHO approach to seeing cultural adaptation as a rigorous sequential process, but I've also too often seen cultural adaptation by NGOs as just grabbing the elements you like and dropping the things that are difficult or challenging. Does this fit in with your experience or do you have more confidence in buy-in to rigor and cultural adaptation by NGOs? It's a complicated question. Um, of course. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course I agree. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think the, I think that's always the, the tendency is to pick the things that you think are best and are easiest and fit. But the challenge that I've always come across and I think the tension about the cultural adaptation process is just not knowing kind of when you've gone too far um, and when you're compromising kind of the integrity of the original intervention as it was designed. And I've had experiences when working with people who are truly experts in the intervention and are insistent that nothing changes, uh, in which case it's just, we have all of these usability challenges, I think, in terms of uh, how actually, how functional it can be in different contexts. Um, so yeah, I think I can report back to Alistair on that one, perhaps. Any other thoughts or questions that people have, reflections? Hi, Claire, it's Kelly. I just put a um, question in the chat, but I can answer it or I can ask it out loud. Um, that was so fabulous. Oh my goodness, so exciting. And I love all your figures. Um, the complexity is important. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm so very intrigued and excited by the human-centered design piece. And I know that some of us have talked about that in a small group with you before, but I was really interested to know um, how, um, with using that framework, how you approach thinking about structural drivers of health disparities and socio um, socio environmental influences and in, in, like social determinants of health. Totally. It's a great question. I think in some ways 
the human-centered design approach really lends itself to thinking about a more holistic approach to addressing mental health in that um, the issues that are most salient to people or the challenges they face, these interventions can really be designed to kind of fit those existing constraints or problems that are, we know are very much related. And I think you're getting at one of the main challenges of some of the existing intervention options that we have, which are almost too narrowly focused, that they, they don't absorb some of those other um, essential pieces that relate to psychosocial well-being and all of these other determinants that you mentioned. Do you have thoughts about that, Kelly? Any kind of reflections from your side? I don't. I would love to jump on the human-centered design bandwagon, um, but I'm trying to understand how it makes sense in the broader context of the world. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um... My name is Joseph Petrolli. If nobody else is speaking, can I ask you another question, Claire? Please, go ahead. And following up on the fact that, uh, uh, as Kelly is very interested in human-centered design, a question I've always had um, is, I thought your presentation was fantastic. And one of the things I really liked about it is you pointed out very directly the heterogeneity of the target populations with which we deal, right? Um, it seems to me, and it's always seemed to me a bit, that HCD isn't always well-suited for that heterogeneity, right? Because you're including certain representatives from the community that come up with very good local solutions that that group sees as relevant and important and workable. Uh, and of course, we all know working in groups that you have those group dynamics in which some people are stronger than other people with louder voices, more informed, more, you know, take a more active role. And all, all of that's fine. But it seems to me that HCD is better suited for highly localized, almost, you know, uh, that group based <laughs> kind of solutions to problems rather than, than solutions that fit a broader target population. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I totally agree. I think it does kind of hyper-localize. That's kind of why human-centered design is, um, or what it's intended to do in some ways. But the tension that I'm seeing with that I think you're also alluding to is this issue about kind of scalability. Are we compromising scalability by, um, right. by really honing these interventions to fit a specific population? Right. Potentially the people that were involved in the design process. And I think one of the things that I've been thinking about is I'm wondering if instead of investing in these intervention outputs, like these intervention products, should we instead be investing in the process and instead thinking about the human-centered design process as really what we would recommend to different contexts to go through this process of design, maybe drawing from previous examples, because I I think the usability challenges that we see with these uh, universal intervention products are really complicated. And so I'm not sure exactly where that balance is between really making things fit and ensuring that we can enhance scalability, except for by really advocating for this process as being part of any um, intervention implementation um, process that we, we do. But do you have other ideas? I feel like there could be other perspectives on that. I mean, yeah, I, thanks, thanks for, for that. I was um, kind of by way of answering that, I also liked uh, where you talked about the CETA approach and I liked the modularity of it and the uh, non-dogmatism, non if that's a word, of it. And the fact that it recognizes that there are lots of moving pieces, all of which need to be sort of calibrated to the local situation that you find, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's great to have broad, general kinds of solutions, but ultimately um, those solutions, of course, as you've said, are going to have to fit you know, the needs of, of that local population. So to, to the extent that you can have that kind of flexibility uh, built in and that kind of uh, awareness of how uh, 
how limited generalized solutions are. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's really, uh, that's really critical. And that's something that I thought the CETA, and I don't know too much about that. I, it's made me want to learn much more about that approach. But that's something that I really thought was maybe a lesson that everybody needs to learn is, you know, uh, just the humility of going into situations, understanding that, no, this isn't a solution that's going to work for everyone, but we do know what good solutions often, what sort of components are contained in good solutions. And let's mm -hmm. see what that looks like in this case. Sure. Yeah. And if you are interested in CETA, I should um, give a shout out to m my colleague, Jeremy Kane, who's in the epidemiology department, who has done a lot of work on CETA for past 10 plus years. Um, so I'm sure he would be very eager to talk if you're interested in learning more Great. about that specific approach. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I see a hand from Les and then Ginny and Alistair and Clarissa, I think. <laughs> Les, do you want to... Sure. Hi, Claire. That was so great. And <clears throat> I loved your graphics. But I must confess, I kind of fell off the bandwagon when you got to the fidelity uh, fit split, because in other areas, like the areas I know well, hand washing studies or studies about home filtration, most of the benefit <clears throat> in a randomized controlled trial seems to be placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And that's placebo effect when you're measuring the nutritional status of a child. What the heck does placebo effect mean in a mental health trial when the main outcome is self-reported indicator? So I wonder if all these trials don't scale up because actually they're just like trial effects. And given that there are these other things, like I saw a review from Oxford a little while ago suggesting giving out cash as an amazing benefit for mental health well-being. Like, should we be like always trying to compare these interventions with, for example, equal distributions of cash or something that's kind of culturally neutral and will give us some ability to start figuring out what's a great effect versus what's uh, just some sort of attitudinal effect related to the dynamics of our individuals at play? That wasn't a completely coherent thought, but like I, I'm, I'm not completely convinced of the fidelity fit struggle. I, I can see something else at play here potentially. Totally, yeah, thanks Les. And I would completely agree. I think there are a lot of other questions and elements that could explain the lack of kind of translatability or impact of a lot of the research that's been done. And I think for some of the, the reasons you mentioned in particular, um, like we see all the time that just kind of asking people, for example, about alcohol use multiple times somehow reduces their alcohol consumption. And so I think that that's absolutely true. And I guess the, the question, I mean, I think that this really gets at this issue about kind of precision. And I think you're right for many, a lot of, there's a lot we can do by thinking cross sectorally or multi-sectorally about the determinants of mental health and how can we integrate support for people um, through potentially cash transfers or through other approaches. But I think there still is a need for ensuring that there's adequate kind of more um, focused perhaps mental health support as well. So I think it's, I think it, the layered approach is really what, uh, what I would say in response to that. Thank you. Thanks Les. All right. I I forgot who is next. Um, I see on my screen it's Alistair, but please. Well, I'll jump in. So Claire, and sorry, I've been having to dash in and out. So you may have addressed this in a way, but I'm, I'm partly picking on the discussion with Joseph and Les in a way. It seems to me that your, your presentation has brought us to a usual spot in MHPSS, which doesn't, which doesn't mean we go around and around in circles, but it's essentially whether there is any technical impact of well-designed interventions and uh, or whether really echoing les the essential thing is around community engagement and, and and processes at community level that will be very much you know uh, exogenous sorry you know endogenous capacities rather than exogenous re resources and and i think i've shifted a bit really through the the ceta pm plus literature that there is something 
about a well-designed intervention that's more than just having the community on side and setting their own objectives. And so it almost wonders whether there's there's two separate things here. One is a sort of a technical mental health intervention. One is a good community engagement strategy. And we're trying to glue them together and make them one thing, or whether there is a continuum, if, if you like. And we can try and get essentially the best of both worlds where we're bringing something with technical fidelity and real impact because of, of the, its understanding, technical understanding, but we're delivering it in an, in an effective way. So it, it's not so much a question, but it's just a reflection on those last three comments that it seems we get, we get stuck in that space about whether there's, go back to Les, is there a, ha a technical hand-washing effect here mm -hmm. or is it all a, you know, a very nice placebo related to community engagement and, and, and support? Yeah, it's such a good question. I think this is, relates again to like the fact that I really don't think there's one solution, right? Like this one size fits all problem. And I think the, a lot of these interventions have really been marketed in that way, or at least taken up in that way. But I think there is some value for all of these pieces, but it's just figuring out how to position them almost. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Alistair. All right, Clarissa, I think you're next on my screen. This is, this is related to Alistair's comment and, and what he'd written in the chat as well. And it's, it's really about the capacity issue because I, I don't think it's that the NGOs, for example, are always choosing the easiest way but I wonder what, if anything, you've been able to get at in terms of capacity to do, to do those types of, of, um, of nuanced interventions and to readjust when things aren't working right. Um, and if you look at some of the organizations who were the implementers where you've done the work, what comes to the top in terms of what capacities they had to be more successful in making those adjustments. Yeah, I think, and you're getting at this, this point that I think has become very clear to me is that we always say like these adjustments have to be made. We have to adapt things, but there's very little guidance I think on how to do that, um, which I think is where there's often a bottleneck. People recognize that this needs to be done, but it's hard to know for this given intervention, what changes we can make or what we can't make. And I think um, Stephanie's very familiar with this as so she's been looking at the data for this UNODC project where that's really what a lot of people are asking for. A lot of practitioners are asking for is more guidance on how to make those adaptations. So I think that is, is one challenge. Um, in terms of, of capacity, I mean, that's a really good question. I think an advantage to a more locally owned and designed approach is that I feel like there is more a stronger sense of autonomy to make those decisions about what needs to change and what needs to shift. And sometimes these more uh, hyper structured intervention approaches just feel more inflexible. And so that's sometimes more difficult, I think, unless you are truly an expert in that program about how to make those shifts when things aren't working. Um, did I, answer I mean, I think also a piece that may be worth thinking more about is also just what the incentive structures are in an organization. Mm -hmm. So we, it came up a little bit in, in some of your Tanzania work mm -hmm. of who gets paid to do what, mm -hmm. um, but, there, but all of the structural incentives within an organization around who gets to make those decisions on what gets, um, what gets revised and what are the other incentives in the organization or outside the organization that are affecting how those staff make decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good point. And a lot of the ways in which these programs are evaluated is not based on their impact, it's more about their process. So I think that's a problem that you're alluding to a little bit. Yes. I see that there's one minute left. I can, I don't know if I can stay on to, to talk to Ginny and Mike for a second, but I'm happy to take those questions if there's time. Let Terry, I'll ask. Uh, sure, go ahead. You can just quickly wrap it up, but just let me thank you, Claire. This okay. is excellent, excellent talk. Very complicated, and the discussion is great. So, thank you. Thank you. Claire, I wanted to say the same, the same thing, and just my comment is very, very simple. Um, if you look around the um, folks that have attended the conference, and and all of us, this is a largely global group. These are folks that work all over the place. 
I just want to state the obvious that these principles are entirely relevant to U.S. Um, implemented programs, the diversity even in a single city, the reasons why programs do not really um, have fidelity or they're not effective. It's, it's so true. And I think it is not as well understood um, in the United States in, in domestic programs. Would you agree with that? Totally. And I think also there's more rigidity in the system too, which makes it harder to be more flexible, I think. And from a, in terms of kind of latitude and doing things that are outside of the, the way that um, certain services are, are structured or what's considered um, acceptable in terms of how services are implemented. But I would, I would totally agree. I think we see the same problems everywhere. Yeah. Yep. Mike. Thank you, Claire, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, you've obviously stimulated us in a, in a great way. I think that um, we need to return to cultural humility and ask whether, why it is that we think that the, uh, all the main ideas about interventions that will work have to come from us, the experts, when there may be culturally defined idioms of distress, cultural practices like cleansing rituals or whatever that may be highly useful in reducing stigma that we would never think about in a billion years because it comes from a different cosmology. I, I just wanted to note that there's something about the adaptation approach that still very much assumes West is best. And uh, in terms of your question about, do we just focus on process or is there something more I would conjecture that what we need is a sequenced approach. And the first step would be the process. It would be the focus on the community engagement with real humility, really trying to unearth people's own understandings, priorities. And there's something that is very effective that doesn't get enough attention and that's agency. People's own agency in making decisions about what's the priority, what are we going to do about it, all the perceived efficacy and the social mobilization that, that goes with that has a big effect. Maybe that's the placebo, but I don't think it's strictly placebo. I think it's just something that we have overlooked because we're so convinced that we have the answer and people just need to adopt it. But if we could do that first and then work towards identifying the what are the specific things that need to happen to boost people's mental health, and it would be a mix of local things and then some outsider things, but without the outsider things being lowered in on a helicopter, so to speak, I think we would get a lot farther. Thank you. Totally agree, Mike, thank you. Yes, I completely agree. All right, well, I thank you everyone. It's been so nice to talk with all of you and really helpful for me to think through and process some of these concepts as well. So thanks, and thanks Terry for giving me the space to do this. Thank you, thank you.